Well, good morning. How are you? It's great to see you. Um, so good to have our children worshiping and leading worship with us today. Uh, we want them to know that they're leaders and they can take part in leading us and be a part of what God's doing here at our church. Uh, they left the jingle bells here. I'm probably going to trip over them. Don't laugh when that happens. Okay, I like to move around. I just noticed that, so that'll be interesting this morning. Uh, really excited to continue talking about uh, the Christmas story today. We're going to be in the kind of the mode of the shepherds, that part of the story that's just really fascinating. You often hear uh, the shepherds and the angels, and we'll kind of unpack that. It's spoken of in a very worshipful sense. It's a time of worship and celebration. Um, but for me, the Christmas story is so fascinating, and especially in this part of the story, is because of the humble beginnings in which God decides to begin his mission. And that's very much what's happening with Jesus being born, brought into the world, away in a manger, kind of off to the side, no, nothing really big about it. It's kind of quiet, under the radar type of thing. Uh, but it's a humble beginning for the mission of God to spread to the entirety of the world, for God to bring his salvation his promise, his invitation, his opportunity for all those who will come to know his son and believe that Jesus died on the cross and gave up his life for them. He's starting it in this way. And you think about stories all, you know, throughout the world and Apple, right? This billions of dollar company, what it's worth now started in a garage by a by a nerd, you know what I mean? Like just by this humble beginnings, you think about Microsoft, right? How big it is and how it touches so many things. Two college guys with an idea to, to make a computer. Starbucks started with one coffee shop. I believe it was maybe three friends and then it ultimately gets bought out and it becomes this multinational company. Our church started under a tree, maybe 40 people that decided to worship under a poplar tree and now it's become what it is today. You always have to start somewhere. And so with God, with Jesus being born, how is he going to start spreading the message? How is he going to introduce the savior? The Messiah is here. He has come, what you've been waiting for, for all these years. There's 400 years of silence between the Old Testament in the New Testament, how is the mission going to progress? Go to Luke chapter two, verses eight is where we're gonna start. We're gonna go through probably eight through 20 is what we're gonna cover this morning. We're gonna unpack the shepherd's story and give a little bit of insight and connection points to you as we wrap our hearts around the message of Jesus this Christmas. Look at verses eight and nine. It says, after Jesus was born, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were absolutely terrified. It's what happens when an angel shows up. There's, there's terror, there's, there's fear. It's big, it's bright. But it, the shepherds are kind of brought into the story a little bit out of nowhere. And what I see from this, and, and you can take notes if you want. I think there's five fill in the blanks this morning. The first thing is you never know how and when God is going to show up in the world. You never know how and when God's gonna show up in your life. And what's happening, these shepherds are out there doing their job. We'll talk about where they are and why they're doing what they're doing here in just a minute. But God just all of a sudden reveals himself through an angel and shows up in their story and in their life. And it's the same with you and I. You can be, you know, years going through your life and your job and a situation and all of a sudden a circumstance happens or God introduces you to someone or the Holy Spirit moves in a way and convicts you to think about something new or something that's next you never know when and how God is gonna show up in your life. And let's make it very clear for all of us in the room. God is still alive and he is still active, amen? He's not dead, he's not quiet, 
He's not absent. He's not a God that just created the world and decided to be up in heaven and let us figure it out because that would just be terrible. We would screw it up and in many ways we probably are, but he's still moving and active and working and he's present. The Holy Spirit of God is moving and working and he's present in every believer. And so God is intricately and intimately involved in your story and the story of humanity. He is moving and he is like looking and actively wanting to move and work through our lives. And so what happens with a lot of us is we wanna get to a comfortable place that we just kind of steady, we're solid, we're where we're at, we've got all the things, our ducks in a row, comfortable, we have it where we wanna be. But man, God is not a God that wants you to always be comfortable may not make you feel good on Christmas time. You know what I mean? Like preacher, what are you talking about? He wants to move. He wants to show up in your life and take you to new places and reveal more of himself to you, his character to you. We never arrive with God and he's never done with you. The work is never done in your heart, your life, your family, your marriage, your understanding of him, your ability to seek him and pursue him and understand him and pray to him and worship him. He is just wanting to continue to show up. And he does that through the Holy Spirit. And he does that in ways that you can't even comprehend. Maybe it's getting you to move somewhere. The ways in which he's worked in, think about your life and your story to get you to where you're at. The way he revealed my wife to me, the way he took both of us to the college neither of us wanted to go to and forced us to to meet one another and the people that you meet that get you along the way. You never know when God's gonna show up. And the shepherds are out here doing their thing. The next fill in the blank I want you to put, this is really interesting to me, is God often shows up in humble circumstances to humble people. Now, when I wrote that, that can have two different meanings. I'm not saying he shows up to humble you. I'm saying he shows up to people who are humble. And we talked uh, last week about those of us who want favor in our lives with God. You humbly come under the word of God, the authority of his word, his scriptures. He wants to lead you. God wants to have authority in your life to do what he wants to do in and through your life. Why? He bought you at a price. He paid for you with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. He purchased you and he wants that relationship with you. And he's not a dictator. You're not his slave. You get to follow the king. You get to walk with him by his presence, by the Holy Spirit. He wants you. He wants to lead you. But oftentimes he shows up to people you wouldn't expect. And you probably think about in your own life, the ways in which God has come after you and humbled you and loved you and cared for you and helped you through a hard time and got you through a difficult moment, brought you to a place of blessing you never would have expected introduced you to the people that have helped you get to where you're at now. So many ways in which, anybody feel that? Where he's shown up in your life and he's blessed you and he's provided for you and he's given you money you didn't even earn or whatever the case may be. These shepherds are humble people doing the Lord's work. They're out in the field. They're taking care of the sheep, the lamb. Many people believe that these are the shepherds that are taking care of the sheep and the lambs that were used for worship. And they're so unheralded, they're forgotten about. They're kind of the the lowest end of the totem pole, the way shepherds are viewed. They're not even supposed to be near cities. They're They're meant to be far away from the people. They're dirty, they smell bad, their job, all of that they're looked at as essentially the lowest type of people as far as their work goes. But God decides to come to these humble people doing their role, playing their part faithfully to reveal the most significant piece of information the world's ever been given, that Jesus, the Messiah, has come. And God sends his angel, which means he's a messenger, to bring the news that he has been born and he chooses the shepherds. And what I wanna tell you is that no matter the circumstance that you're in in your life, how 
humble it may feel, how lost you may feel, how confused you may feel with life, jobs, relationships, your future, your finances, whatever it may be. If you choose to faithfully follow the Lord, regardless of the place of life you're in, regardless of the humble circumstances you are in, you are putting yourself in a place where you are inviting God to be a part of your story. You are showing your faithfulness to him that come what may, no matter what life looks like, no matter how people see me, whatever the story is, you humbly follow the king. And God wants to see faithful, humble people. And he chooses that to reveal the news of his mission beginning to these shepherds out in the field. And so you go to Luke 10, 2, verse 10. I want to read 10 through 12 to continue the story. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Easy for you to say, right? I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And so now the good news, the gospel, right? I'm bringing you the news that the Messiah is being born. Verse 11, today... In the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Can you imagine being a shepherd that no one really cares about? You're out in the field, you're doing your thing, you're just playing your role, and an angel shows up and you realize God has decided to drop this knowledge and information onto you. Who, the, the person we've been waiting for for years and years and years in the line of David, the one that was promised from Genesis has now been born and you are telling us. It's incredible. Verse 12, this will be a sign to you. Notice this, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So my wife found this uh, last week, just digging into this story and the scriptures and the story of the shepherds. It's fascinating why the angel says this and why they chose the shepherds. Now, many believe that these shepherds, you may wonder, why, did, why were these guys chosen? Why were these people chosen for this moment? The, many believe that the reason is they use the words that wrapped in the cloths as like a signal to these shepherds because what their role is, the fact that they're close enough to Bethlehem to the city means that they're probably shepherds that take care of the sheep and the lambs that were used uh, for the animal sacrifices for the festivals or for worship for the Levitical priests. They were the shepherds that provided and took care of the animals that would be used to worship God. And what we know is that they would use lambs that were meant to be unblemished. They were meant to be perfect and pure as the sacrifice offering to God. They, they couldn't be tainted. They had to be unblemished. So what the shepherds would do in this time for the sake of worship to be done properly, they would take the lambs that were meant to be unblemished and they would wrap them in cloths like a, like a baby or a child would be to protect them from getting hurt. And they would care for them and they would take care of them as if it was like a child and they would nurture them in preparation for them to be right and pure for the holy act of worship when they were sacrificed to God. So when you look at Exodus 12, I'm gonna skip that point. If we go to Exodus 12, five, it says your lamb shall be without what? Without blemish. This was the sacrifice that was made in the Exodus in the, when he was telling them to give the sacrifice to show that they would put the, the blood around the doorpost, the Passover. And so the indication is that these shepherds would understand what it means to prepare a lamb that was meant to be unblemished and given over for worship. And so what they're gonna go see in just a moment is the son of God that was born that has to be unblemished, that will live a perfect life for 33 or so years, that would live untainted, sinless, and go to the cross as our 
perfect, unblemished, sacrificial lamb to pay the price for our sins on the cross so that we could be invited into a relationship with God, who after three days would be resurrected and brought into heaven after 40 days and the promise of a resurrected eternal life with God would now be presented to the entire world. Amen. And these shepherds get it more than most people would. The prophetic story that this Messiah has to be untainted and unblemished, wrapped in cloths would be the sign. And so you think about the ways in which God could get his mission going, get the story to unravel. The Messiah is here. The point that I skipped that I wanna put on the screen is what God does to the individual can ultimately be used to impact the multitudes. Because you think about these shepherds who have to be just ecstatic, scared, overwhelmed that they're chosen to hear the message of Jesus, to hear the message that the Messiah has come and they're being invited to be the first ones to go see it and experience it and realize this is happening. God is moving and the mission is happening. And it's a humble circumstance with humble people. But God often chooses to bring an individual into a circumstance with Jesus where they're so overwhelmed and so filled with appreciation and worship that they can't help but be affected by seeing and connecting with Jesus that they have to tell the world around them. And that's exactly what God wants to do with you and I. He does not desire Christians that go through the motions and this is just another story and another Christmas and another group of kids singing the songs we always sing and another just another year of going through it. No, 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 no. He wants believers on fire with the message of Jesus Christ that is the salvation of the world that is all in with the realization that his mission was thousands of years ago brought from shepherds to your heart, the message of salvation so that you as an individual wouldn't, jingle bells, would encounter, it happened, I didn't trip though, would encounter the message of Christ. And it wouldn't just be something that becomes old news. It's still good news in your heart. It still fires you up that you are saved, that he sent his son, he was perfect, and he took the worst punishment you could imagine in your place so that you could be saved, and that you could encounter the love of God through the perfect son. But does it stop there? Or are you so filled with the Lord so inspired by his message, so overwhelmed by the glory of this mission that started in a field with a shepherd and a little baby put in a feeding trough and wrapped in cloths where nobody could see it. It reached your life and it changed your life. And now it's meant to do something within you so it spreads to your family, your friends, your workplace, your neighborhood, whoever God puts you in contact with. The mission is still spreading, amen? It's still going, but it takes you and I being filled with the spirit and overwhelmed by the message and the love of Christ to go into this world and to show the world what Jesus is all about. May we not be lukewarm Christians going through the motions eating too many cookies, wrapping too many gifts, spending too much money, watching too much movies, doing too many things that take us out of what this is all about. The mission and the message of Christ going to the world. And so he's inviting these shepherds to have an individual experience, connection and encounter with Jesus for a purpose. And so he is that lamb of God. We talked about from Exodus and the Passover. I wanna give you three scriptures just to cement the idea of the unblemished 
perfect lamb of God. Look at John 1 29. This is John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. He says the next day, it says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy. 1 Peter 1.19 For you know that it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, a sinful life. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. It's Jesus. It's Jesus, the perfect unblemished lamb of God. Revelation 5 verse 12. In a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He deserves it all because he filled the mission. He fulfilled the purpose. And so then I want us to make this personal and apply it a little bit to us. Look at Luke 2, 13 through 14. It says, suddenly, look what happens. A great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel. In other words, there was one angel giving the message. Now you have a plethora of angels showing up in this moment. What that means is this is a holy moment. The tone changes. Heaven is now coming to earth to indicate something spectacular and major is happening. You don't often see in in the Bible all the time, heaven and earth combining. And now there's this unity that happens with the angels and what's gonna happen with the shepherds. It says they're praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. The indication is heaven has now come to earth. Jesus who sat the right hand of God has been obedient to come from heaven in perfection to earth to become a man, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, which we'll talk about next week. He's gonna grow up and he's gonna fulfill the calling on his life. And so in this moment, you have a a, a collaboration of heaven and earth. And here's what I wanna tell you. There's language in the New Testament that calls you and I as believers to operate in a heavenly place, to have our heart and our mind set on heavenly things. We pray for on earth as it is in heaven. You remember that in the Lord's Prayer? There's this idea that we're citizens of heaven, not citizens of earth because we belong in eternity with God. And what you find here is the angels come and they're indicating there's a heavenly thing happening. And what I wanna encourage you with, the only way, listen to me, the only way in this life to experience the heavenly things and to take part in what God's invited you into, even in this life, to experience those heavenly connections what worship is and the purity of a connection with God, kind of practicing what our eternal life will look like is through Jesus Christ. It's the message and the introduction of Jesus that now combines the the heavenly realms to the earthly realms. And what's cool is some of you have experienced that when you pray or when you truly worship with your heart abandoned to God, you're not any longer feeling the stresses of this life, the anxieties of this world, you feel a connection to your heavenly father. Anybody experience that? It's like the things of life turn off. And when you're in the zone with God and your heart is fully immersed in Christ, it's like you're experiencing a heavenly moment. And that's my desire one as a man personally, but it's my desire for you. Not just in the season when Jesus is kind of forefront in the birth and the story and all of that, but in your life and in your story, you can experience heaven combined with earth as you pursue him and worship him and desire him and wrap your heart around him and make him the foremost of your life. 
can experience more of him. You know, the next time we're gonna see a group of angels connected with Jesus, he's gonna be returning to earth for the second coming, ready to bring his people back home, amen? And so you have this incredible scene. Verse 15 and 16 says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. They received the invitation, which the Lord has told us about. Verse 16, so they hurried. Everyone say, they hurried. Say it again, they hurried. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. This convicted me a little bit because the angels show up, they were scared. Then they're just invited. Hey, the Messiah has come. Jesus is here. He's been born. And now they're not around him. They have a choice to make. This invitation to go experience Christ, the Messiah. And their response was to hurry up to go be with him. And right when I read that this week, this is what I wrote down. We should be in a hurry to be closer to Jesus. And I thought about it this week. I'm in a hurry to watch football. You're in a hurry for me to finish so you can go to lunch and beat the Baptist church to the, you know, little Italy. You know what I mean? Just be honest. I'm a press, you know. We're in a hurry for our kids to grow up. We're in a hurry to climb the ladder at work, to make more money, to do more of this, to do more of this, to do more of this. We should be in a hurry to be close to Jesus. I, we just want to experience like a taste of heaven on earth. And I don't know, I feel like people kind of get bored with the Jesus thing. We get bored with the Bible. We get bored with prayer. We get bored with worship. We get bored with the message series. We get bored with the Christian things. And man, I just want you to be invited this season to just strip all of that away and whatever is encumbering your heart, being all in with the Savior and fully immersed with the Messiah, the one who came to pay the price for you and I, Think about the old holy night, fall on your knees. Man, we sing it, but do we do it, right? I don't wanna go through the motions with Christ. I want my heart to just be so tied to him. Through the busyness and the kids and life and your marriage and all of it, Jesus is what, what will tie your heart, your job, your marriage, your kids to the heavenly things. He's what keeps you centered on the Lord. Fight to be in a hurry for Christ. Show your children that you are in a hurry to pray, to sit with him, to praise him, to worship him, to honor him, to be more in love with him, to show your affection, your appreciation, to acknowledge him. The world makes us in a hurry for a lot of things, but God's invited us to have an encounter and a connection and a relationship with the one who came to die for you and I. And the shepherds get it. They're out here in the fields and they have this invitation to be, to be invited into something special, to see the one God has brought. And God's made a way for the Holy Spirit to live within all believers. You have a connection with the Father at every moment, all day, every single day. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? seek and pursue him wrapping up the story here verse 17 through 20 says when they had seen him their response was to spread the word concerning what they had been told what they had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them but mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart verse 20 this is kind of the lasting point before we take communion. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen 
which were just as they had been told. I think as you and I go through life, if we were just to be very practical about this, you don't often find yourself just spontaneously worshiping and praising God. We're very reactionary, feel things, people upset us, we're stressed, we're, we're overwhelmed, we're fearful, we're anxious, we're rushing around, we're trying to figure things out, we're busy. There's a lot going on in your mind. But when I read this, I just felt like the more you pursue Jesus, the more likely you are to live a life of worship. And we'll put that on the screen. The closer you are to Jesus, the more likely you are to be in a place of gratefulness, of worship, of thanksgiving, of appreciation, of acknowledging your Father. You can go weeks and months without your heart really being in a place of worshiping Him. You can sit in a room like this and not be able to stop thinking about the things in your life and in your world that are holding you back and overwhelming you. But when these shepherds were invited to be with Jesus and to see him and to kind of understand, yeah, this is the mission of God. This is the story. God's on the move and it's through this little child that he's gonna raise up the savior and the Messiah and he's gonna pay the price. And so when you spend time with Jesus in his word and you pray and you worship and you come into places like this, you're reminded of the power of the gospel. And when you truly come close to Christ, I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't, whatever hardship or tragedy or difficulty you're facing, when you come close to Jesus, you cannot help but worship him, amen? Because he saved you and he did what God called him to do. You read that story when he's in the garden, dealing with the emotions of being separated from the Father, having to go through the pain that he went through. He did it for us, why? So you could be loved by God and you could feel a connection with the Father. Man, I'm preaching to myself, like spend more time centered around the gospel so you can operate in a way that's heavenly <laughs> and understanding Jesus is everything and he's the only source of satisfaction you're truly gonna find. And he's what merges the relationships in your life together, puts you in a place of wisdom and discernment and leadership with decisions in your life. I pray that you find and make the time to be in a hurry to be with Jesus this season. Because when you do, you will worship. Because when you wrap your arms around the gospel, and salvation, and what this is all about, you can't help but worship the King. And that's what we're called to do. And we're gonna take a moment now to do that through communion. If you wanna get your elements ready, the bread that represents his body and the juice that represents his blood, I just simply wanna give you a moment to be in a hurry to rest your heart and mind on Christ this morning, to just sit in the truth of what this story is all about that God did send his son to pay that price so that you could receive the gift of eternal life through this salvation. Let's just simply take a moment and honor our father for Jesus, praise him and worship him for what he means to us. And then we'll take it together and I'll pray for us to close. Go ahead and have a time of prayer with your heavenly father. Well, together, let's take the bread that represents the body that was broken for us on the cross and the juice that represents the blood that he shed for us when he sacrificed his life for us. 
Let's stand as we close. I want to pray over us and invite the prayer partners forward. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're in this room, you came to watch a child sing and you don't know Jesus and something convicted your heart this morning, we are ready to have that conversation with you this morning. We have people up front ready to hear from you. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you this morning. But Father, we honor you today. We thank you for a time of worship. We thank you for a time of lifting up the name of Jesus. Thank you for your story, sharing this news with the shepherds that encountered the baby Jesus, the Messiah. And they were so filled with joy, they walked away praising you and inviting others to hear about this Jesus. May we be a people that rejoices in the story of Christ. We thank you for saving us through his death and resurrection. If there's anyone in the room that has not yet come to know Christ, draw them to yourself. Help them overcome whatever barriers that is holding them back from accepting you as their Lord and Savior. And may as a church and as families and as followers of Christ, May we go through this Christmas season worshiping and honoring you because you simply deserve it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.